to another community conversation here at Educause, and I am super excited today to be joined by Karen Stout, who is the head of Achieving the Dream, um, an organization focused on student success that I have been interested in, admired, and now I'm really excited to be joining the board of uh, ATD. So welcome, Karen. Thanks, John. I'm so excited that you're coming on our Achieving the Dream board. What, when, you, uh, when you're in a, let's say, three-floor elevator ride, how do you explain uh, Achieving the Dream to people? That's a hard one. I say in, in a quick sentence, I say that we are a nonprofit that works with community colleges across the country to build their capacity to help more students get into their colleges, through their colleges, and into a career with meaning uh, and a career that contributes to their community. And how long, uh, it, it, I, I remember achieving the dream when I was a community college president, so I feel like this work has been going on for how long? 20 years. This is our 20th yeah. anniversary year. And I too remember achieving the dream at the beginning as a community college president. I think we probably served in our presidencies around the, around the same time. Uh, and you know, from my perspective, when my college joined achieving the dream, you know, I, I drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> That's what that's what got me into this role, and now I'm starting my tenth year as the president of Achieving the Dream. Yeah, isn't it funny how the time? I'm in my ninth year, and I go, "When did that happen?" Like, oh, I feel like we're living parallel lives in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the uh, and you mentioned uh, your presidency. Which campus was that? Montgomery what? County Community College, outside of Philadelphia, the Montgomery in Pennsylvania. Where I've been twice, I think, because uh, one of the major influencers in the Educause community is Celeste Schwartz, and so you work directly with her. So um, she's kind of a I did, sure, I did, uh, and you know, coming into the presidency, I had a deep appreciation for data and technology because of my previous role at Camden County College, where I actually oversaw information technology and institutional research and institutional effectiveness and planning. And I saw all of the connections of, of, of those four things. So when I started at Montgomery and Celeste was in a role that was leading IT and I immediately spotted her talent and the contributions she had already made to the college. And by the way, Celeste is retiring this year. So <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I how for her. Oh, good, good. I, 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 I moved her like immediately onto the executive team. I, you know, I'm a big believer that uh, the CIO, well, I made her CIO, moved her onto the executive team, that the CIO has to have a seat at the leadership table if we're really going to move our organizations forward. And I think that's, and when, when, when Achieving the Dream started, was technology on the radar very much? Technology was oh, on the radar yeah. because data was on the radar and data was on the radar because we were really trying to understand the student experience and we were asking our colleges to look at their current student data and to disaggregate it. That was back in 2004. That was probably the first time there was a national move to ask colleges, community colleges, to disaggregate their data and then to ask questions about why some students were succeeding at different rates toward completion than other students. Uh, and you know, technology, of course, and the systems that help the colleges to get to that student experience data uh, became a very important part of the work of achieving the dream. And you know, I, I, when I was at Montgomery, ATD started to partner with Educause way back on, you'll remember this, the iPass work. Yeah. And and that 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 uh, iPass, I think, had a lot of built, I think, some of our thinking around advising redesign now. Back when we started iPass, we really looked at it as a technology solution, I think, too deeply and didn't understand yeah. that systems, processes, and attitudes uh, all have to work together to get to the transformational change we were looking to get to. Well, I'm I'm thinking back to, I'm trying to think when I first was appointed a presidency, I think it was 2010. 
And when I started at the campus, I was asking about sort of what kinds of interventions do we do and what tools do we use? And, and I got the, and I said, we have an early alert system, right? And they said, yes. And I said, and then I waited a few months and said, Hey, can I see that early? And it, I swear it looked, it was a single page. It wasn't, it wasn't technology. And it was a, a form that was filled out to the student, letting them know they were in trouble signed by the registrar of all people. So we've come a long way. Uh, and I think that when ATD started doing its amazing work, technology wasn't on the radar, but I think you, you're seeing it take off as a key. Oh, absolutely. You know, back in 2015 is when I started at ATD. We, we took everything we were learning in those first 10 years of reform and we, we made a big bet that there were seven capacities, fundamental capacities that were essential for colleges to develop to drive student success. And data and technology was one of those, was one of those. And, you know, we joined them together then. Now, 10 years later, uh, we're pulling them back apart. Data, and we're, we're calling it data uh, transformation, digital transformation, uh, and really focusing on the digital transformation piece and not the technology itself. Yeah. Well, I think the exciting thing is the growing understanding that the role technology has to play is in a student experience that, that our, our students are expecting it and um, colleges, universities are gonna need to, to do that. I mean, the sense of urgency around this hasn't really changed. I mean, these needles are so hard to move. Um, and I think community colleges have uh, some interesting barriers that ATD does help them with. For example, limited IR staff. Yep. Uh, it, very challenged with, uh, with, with building IR teams. And so we help them organize their data and craft coherence from their data with our coaches, with our data coaches, the strategy that we use when colleges come in. We're just coming off of our kickoff. 15 new colleges came into our network and we spend four days with, with their teams and a data coach looking at their data, their early momentum data, you know, how students are progressing through that first year, which is really important, some of their program data. And then we've introduced some new data for them to look at, which is around their community, who or what learners are being left behind in their communities. Uh, where are their disconnected youth, disconnected adults, and subpopulations of students that can benefit from a post-secondary education pathway that we're not reaching. So we're bringing internal and external data into that sense making. You, you touched on the real sticking point for, for to your campuses is staffing, resource limitations, bench strength, and the the exciting part of what ATD does is to provide a layer of support that you wouldn't otherwise have. Um, do you think that technology is going to help with the sort of the lack of you know staff to involve? And in I mean the the story we tell ourselves is that technology can lead to improved efficiencies and find ways to do things cheaper, better, faster. And are you seeing any of that? Or is, is the work of student success still a very people hands-on? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, no, I, I see there are opportunities in technology. The, you know, certainly AI, which is a whole nother topic, but we really help our colleges identify the technology that they're using and try to reduce speed. We have colleges, John, that might be using 40 different types of technology to touch students with no integrated strategy on how that yeah. technology is supposed to operate. So we do help them because they have to develop a kind of common data sets, common data warehouses, and you know the proliferation of tools is, while it looks like technology is the solution, it's it becomes a barrier. It becomes, you know, a, a real issue with with implementing strategy. So we try to help colleges look at all of those pieces of technology and map that technology to the student experience so they can identify which pieces of technology they want to keep, which ones they need to integrate and which ones they want to, you know, put sunset. Yeah, you're you're so right and I hadn't thought about that, but one of the 
one of the results you get when you don't have that staffing level to do the integration and coordination is pockets of excellence all That's across right. the organization. And, and then undoing that becomes really tricky. Uh, are, are the products getting better, more sophisticated, more comprehensive, more able to do some of this, or is that still a struggle? I think the I think the products are improving. I think the interoperability of the products is is improving, and I, I think you know Educause has an influence on that. Certainly, the ed tech community is always ahead of where the community colleges are, yeah. uh, and you know the temptation for the well resourced community colleges is to to jump into using another a new piece of technology to the to be the solution. So I think that really is the struggle. The products are good. They continue to get better. The ERP systems are, I, I think the, the vendors are listening to the community colleges more deeply than they used to. Uh, so I see there being improvements, but I think there will always be a disconnect because of how uh, it is hard for us as community college. And maybe this is all of higher education. You'd have a better sense of this. Can't quite keep up. And don't there and therefore don't know the questions to ask when they're going through the procurement processes for some of these pieces of technology. It's it's, it's certainly not limited to to one sector, and um, you know we probably should talk a little more about AI because it has, to some extent, sucked the life out of every. You know, it's like it, you can't have a conversation anymore without thinking of AI, and and what a great example of. I know a grand total of nobody who feels caught up there like that 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 train has left every station and it's probably left prematurely and everybody's rushing to market and, 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 you know, well, we all know the, like, what about, what about ethics? What about bias? What about all these things that, that community college students, faculty, staff are living on a daily basis. Um, so that is, is continually a concern with, with, with all of this. Do, so are, are chat bots sort of settled science now? Are they, does everybody, agree that chatbots are a tool for good in the student experience? A lot of our ATD colleges are using chatbots and improving their advising systems. They're concerned though, deeply concerned about bias in the in the chatbots. And I have a concern about, you know, our, our more well-resourced colleges are able to use them because they can afford them. The less resourced can't. And therefore, the less resource have to continue to put more people to the work, uh, you know, and, and it's very difficult then to figure out what becomes a first tier, second tier and third tier student issue that needs human and a human intervention rather than chatbot intervention. You know, so I don't think they're settled. It's a question of how, like every technology, the technology it depends how you deploy it, how you execute it, and and how you use it. Um, it you, you remind me of probably one of the things that truly keeps me up at night is, you know, digital divide. And, you know, back when we were presidents, everybody was talking about digital divide, right? And it's so weird that now you just don't hear about it the same way as if we, as if we solved it. You know, uh, Brian Alexander wrote a great piece in Educause Review a few years back on sort of the, the history, the story of digital divide. And now uh, with, with this rapid deployment of AI, I'm so concerned. I mean, digital divide on the one hand for students, because these, at least right now, these, these uh, advanced AI platforms require a license that students may or may not be able to afford. And probably those least likely to afford it are community college students um, for obvious reasons. And the and then there's this institutional divide, like you were saying, it's the institutions that can afford the, the enterprise systems and solutions um, sort of are moved up and those that don't are going to fall behind. So I think it's a term, it's a policy it's, issue really, yeah, but. Absolutely. And then there's the faculty divide. The faculty that are, have the professional development resources and tools to learn how to use AI in pedagogy and those that don't. I mean, that that's going to become an issue too. But, you know, when you talk about the digital divide, to me, in the community college space, there's still a lot of conversation about the digital divide because COVID and the pandemic brought it so close uh, to life. 
and you know issues of broadband still exist for a lot of our colleges and access to uh, hotspots and computers and that that still is an issue for our students too yeah yeah it was a wonderful moment during covid where we sort of pulled out all the plugs and we're doing super creative you know lighting up parking lots and doing amazing things and finding ways to get laptops in the hands of students and um but it not probably sustainable right so you know you know one of the things that ccrc just did a study of how community colleges use their covid money the federal covid money and i was fascinated with the amount of dollars that went to tech that went to technology uh, and i thought great that's that's great we're getting to some of that you know the digital divide piece because those dollars were widely available touched 950 community colleges and yet so i'm i thought wow this is great and then i said uh oh what happens with life cycle what happens three to five years from now how do we duplicate that kind of massive investment in technology again uh, that's going to be a concern if I'm sitting in a college president's seat that I'm that I'm worried about. And uh, every CIO watching this is not along because <laughs> because they know. I mean, there's the technology you can buy, but then there's the technology you can sustain and and integrate and support, and and that plate seems to just keep getting added onto. And so, um, well, you know, going back to you, you made a comment earlier about sort of. Um, your experience and and that a key part of of using technology for good um, was elevating a role, creating a CIO position, having that position be on on cabinet. Um, I'm tempted to ask you like who are the who are the inspirations for ATD when it comes to this work? Like who do you point to? But maybe the not asking you to make that choice. What are some of the features you see of of institutions that have really, you know, fully embraced the achieving the dream uh, strategies and are using technology, knowing our audience today in a, in an effective way. What are some other than having a CIO position that's part of the strategic fabric of, of the campus? What are other kinds of features? You know, it, it, it's a good question, and we haven't really looked at the technology features independent of the overall characteristics of strong colleges getting to strong results. Uh, so that question makes me think about those high flyer colleges in our network. Uh, and now in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, so what does their technology structure, organizational structure looks look like? What is their tech degree of technology investment? And as I think about it, I think they're pretty solid. Uh, they've, they've done a good work with uh, you know building out the fundamentals. But you know the the colleges that are really driving outcomes around student success in the network do like five things really. There are five characteristics. They they've clearly defined a north star. They know what their student success gaps are, and they've set targets. And everybody in the organization knows what those targets are. So that's the first thing. So you need data and technology in order to understand that. Uh, the second thing is that they they really have strong fundamentals, and and that means they they've built out a data infrastructure, uh, and you know one of the things I see from a leadership perspective is that we build silos. So we have IT, we have IR, we have institutional effectiveness, we have planning, we have the student success work in verticals, instead of bringing them into horizontals, and I think the best of our ATD colleges have brought them into horizontals, which which means that that CIO or that data analytics person needs to be in the middle of the cabinet, driving those conversations and connected conversations and making really good resource allocation and reallocation decisions to help make sure the college is putting dollars to the interventions that are that can work. So they've built strong fundamentals the third thing is that they use a framework to organize their student success work. Uh, that brings us to like the guided pathways movement and, you know, the loss of momentum framework and those kinds of things. Uh, 
the fourth thing is that the the presidents understand what levers to pull at scale. And that's to me is where technology is the enabler. You know, if we really think about technology strategically, that's how we get to scale. And, you know, so that is full scale overhaul of advising systems that can only be done by thinking about technology and the platform that you're going to use. That's, that's really thinking about really in an integrated way, personalized courseware, and what is your strategy for implementing that in the classroom for what courses in what programs that gets to OER, you know, are we, are you going to have an OER strategy? What does that look like? So it's in that area, that fourth area where leaders have to think about those big levers. What are your big bets? And then figuring out how technology enables the movement of that big bet. And then the last thing we see is that these colleges understand how to move with what I call strategic patience, a sense of urgency with patience. They're not tempted to take on that one small thing <laughs> that might get immediate results, but actually could end up undermining the long-term results that you're trying to get to. Uh, and, you know, so that those are the five things we, we see our colleges that are high performing really embrace. Do any of those resonate from a technology perspective? A scale one, I think, is an obvious one. But... Maybe all of them, yeah. Uh, uh, though my big takeaway is urgency with patience. I know you just you just wrote a great article uh, for Educause Review. Maybe your next one is going to be titled Urgency with Patience. I love that. I love <laughs> okay, that. well, I will try try that. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Um, is the... Does, does Achieving the Dream have or work with another organization to have any kind of assessment tool for technology readiness? No, we have our we have a high level tool in our ICAT, Institutional Capacity Assessment Tool, but we don't have a partner to go deep. Yeah, that might be something as we're, as we're just something. exploring we together. That out. That's great. Our fates are going to be connected for how long did I agree to be on the board for? Three three years. Okay, so part of, we've got three years to figure this out. Uh, one thing I would say that might be worth looking at is um, either, uh, well, I'll just say we have a, a offering called the DX Journey Map, Digital Transformation Journey Map, and it's uh, dx.educause.edu. And it's, it's kind of a very straightforward sort of tool for asking you questions about your institutional readiness for transformation. And then, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. It just matters that you know where you are and you know where you want to go. And then you can start. So the, the journey map helps you identify where you are in this journey and then give you some pointers for. So that might be a, a tool that would be useful. And of course, so much of edu what Educause does is providing resources to support this work. So it'll be it'll be great fun to work with you to think how we can bring our organizations closer together. Uh, you know, our um, new vision statement is inspiring the transformation of higher education in service to a greater good. And I can't imagine a greater organization for us to be working with than, than achieving the dream. Um, so we've got our work cut out for us. You know, you just reminded me of some of the work that our colleges are doing in shortening the shortening terms or dismantling the academic schedule just to create more on and off ramps for students, uh, especially the students that community colleges serve, and all of the technology that's required in that, in, in reassembling a scheduling mechanism, <laughs> and even understanding yeah. what the current scheduling mechanism is. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of intersections here that if I think about the technology piece to that framework I just described, I could go deeper on. We we probably should talk about yep. how we want. Well, it's funny you 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 can point to areas like that where I I have a clear memory of. Remember, Rio Salado was one of the first campuses that was doing that allowed students to start a course at any time. We were like, yes. that is so innovative and wonderful, and we could never do it because our our technology wouldn't allow us to. So That's there's right. there's times where the technology is an obstacle to being able to do amazing innovative things. What what I think is super exciting about the technology landscape now is that technology is sort of moving us to do things we didn't think we could do. And technology is sort of freeing up our ability to think creatively as the technology becomes more 
interoperable and flexible and agile. And as as AI, you know, if it doesn't destroy the free world, if if it does the good things we hope it will, is going to add a an element of agility and flexibility to this that that is going to be a unprecedented. So, a good time to be alive. It absolutely is. You know, I I. The, I also think that the best ATD colleges play offense with their data uh, mindset. So they're not thinking just about compliance or or meeting accreditation standards. You know, that kind of one your heels kind of approach. Yeah. They really well, are thinking more strategically about how to use their data uh, and the the data that they don't have about the students that they aren't that aren't on their campus. I mean, really yeah. opening up, understanding their community in deeper ways, and all the all of the primary, well, all the secondary data that's out there now about about uh, the communities that that they're serving, that in the past they haven't really paid attention to or or clearly mined uh, for you know for thinking about strategic enrollment management and and other. And that's the only way to really get at the equity gaps that are that are still deep in many of in many of our colleges and in our communities. When I when I was a provost of a system, and we would once a year we would talk about the achievement opportunity gap um, in the state where I worked, and every year it was so discouraging because we could identify that those gaps starting third grade yes. like that's what we're at that's what we're up against <laughs> exactly they start earlier than they get than the student gets to the college which is important for us to understand and they persist after a student completes and we have to understand that too and we can we can influence beyond our campuses as leaders and we need to begin thinking that way uh, and we have so we have to understand the data what happens before what happens after so it's clear to me um, that that part of the secret sauce of achieving the dream is data, and that your approach is all in on data. Do you? Uh, and of course, we are deeply concerned about cybersecurity and privacy at Educause, and you know we have lots of tools and resources like the HECVAT for campuses to use. Um, the HECVAT is the higher education vent. <laughs> Higher Education Community Vendor Assessment Tool, something like that. I keep saying it's an acronym only a mother could love, but um, it's a it's a tool that helps campuses when they're buying these products. Because every time we keep talking about solutions, there these are purchases that are made, and and we have some role to play in making sure that what we buy is is uh, uh, shares our values for privacy. And I'm guessing that that's a big part of of your work as well. You know, and we don't inf we don't do a lot with influencing. Uh, we, we we will often get asked about vendors, but we don't. We're agnostic, and we don't really get into that that the, the cybersecurity details. And but um, I do know our colleges are it, it's top of mind for the ATD colleges because so many of them have gone through attacks, ransomware attacks. You know, several of colleges brought to their knees for several months. Uh, and and then lose their student data, and they're almost starting all over in some of their you know, they can't benchmark anymore. And they're rebuilding systems, yeah. so it would be great. You know, you're making me think about the tools that you have that we should figure out a way to make also available to the ATD colleges. I mean, I I know the community colleges highly are highly engaged in it because but probably not to the degree that, that the sector should be. And I, I only say that based on my previous experience with Educause. I remember as a president, I attended several Educauses, but not many community college presidents go to Educause, but they yeah. should. Yeah. No, it's true. Yep. Yeah. They should and walk, it's walk through, through, that, walk yeah, through your vendor. That, yeah. Um, community colleges are the largest sector group of institutional types by Carnegie classification, but as a proportion of how many community colleges there are, um, it's not the penetration. That, so I think it's incumbent on us to partner with you and vice versa. And what you were saying was so true. Like earlier, you said that you've arrived at student success organizationally when it works across all the divisions. And, and, and so when, if this works like it should, 
you can rest assured that the CIO is deeply interested in security and privacy. You can be assured if things are working well that the procurement officer is aware of the need to buy products that support those. So it really does involve, it just goes back to that whole, it's a cabinet effort. And if the cabinet isn't aligned, it's not going to work. But if it is, that's where you can really start to get traction. Absolutely. Well, I feel like we're just starting what will be about a three-year conversation um, <laughs> as I get more acquainted with the great work of achieving the dream and 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 our colleagues on the board become uh, more familiar with what, what Educause can bring to this. We're all trying to make a difference and the stakes are so high and the sense of urgency is so intense. Um, I'm just excited to work with you and take on all this challenge. Well, since ATD has has been anchored for now twenty years in in data, and you know has played in the technology space with you know iPaths and digital courseware through the Every Learner you know Everywhere network and in OER, and uh, now working in the short term space and doing a lot with some of the scheduling vendors, uh, I think the partnership between ATD and Educause is a perfect one that we need to work to develop. It's the right time to really pull our resources together. I agree. Well, with that, I'll just say thank you, Karen, for joining us, making your Thanks, precious John. time available. And we'll talk to you soon. Great. Thank you.